sip of water. Good now, revolutionaries. This is the Rise Up Morning Somewhere show. My name is Evan. I'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Alex Popovich, and together we are co-founders and educators in the block space here to tell a better story about cryptocurrency. We've got a big show today, so whether you listen morning, noon, or night, it's time to rise up and smell the crypto. I am so excited to be the first one to tell you today that the Bitcoin spot ETFs have been approved if you live under a rock, you may not have heard it yet. Of course, if you were on Twitter or on TikTok last night, you saw all the news, but we're going to unpack it, what it means, give Gary Gensler's feedback. We're going to give Hester Pierce's dissenting feedback. And of course, we're going to answer all your crypto questions. We're here every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, 1 p.m. UTC. As you're coming in, tap the screen and be sure to let us know, do you hold crypto? What do you think about the ETF? And if you have another question, then uh, just pop it below. We're happy to answer it. And we're going to be here for a little while. Alex, my brother, how are you this morning? Good, man. I'm good. I'm fired up today. What a day. <laughs> what a day indeed. What a day indeed. Um, <coughs> I'm such a damn coughing. <laughs> coughing about it. You would? Yeah, yeah. I need to do like you and get myself a straw to drink from. I'm at that age now, I guess. Look at this old guy on my cup. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, dude, we are uh <clears throat> I had a um had a good good evening yesterday. Went out with uh went out with some friends that I used to be stationed with. I haven't seen in a long time. Got dinner. Read uh read some stuff, got all fired up about about the SEC, um, just I'm ready to talk about Gary and Gary and Hester. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, let me let me give everyone. You want to just jump right into it, and I can give everybody a quick preview. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me say once more again: if you're just joining us, this is the Rise Up Morning Show. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. 7 a.m. Central Time, 1 p.m. UTC, and the conversation is always live in our Discord at discord.gg slash the many. Be sure to give the screen a tap, hit the little share button down below, send this to a friend you know who's crypto curious, because today we're going to be talking about the Bitcoin ETF that was just approved, what it means. Yesterday, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approved the listing of multiple spot Bitcoin ETP shares exchange traded product shares. It's a big time development for the crypto industry. This is years in the making after disapprovals, after legal discussions, including a notable case involving Grayscale, who did get approved. Um, the Ten SEC's, years. I'm sorry? 10 years we've been waiting for this shit. 10 years we've been waiting for this. And of course, that that's not meaning that anybody anywhere can just go out and buy one of these ETFs today. There's a long road still to listing, but the products will be traded on registered national securities exchanges. Um, 10 spot Bitcoin ETFs were approved in total simultaneously. These include major institutions like BlackRock, Grayscale, ARK, Bitwise, Wisdom Tree, Fidelity, Vanek, and a couple of others that you've heard of. So these are gonna be on different platforms, almost certainly one near you. Our friend Joe said it was up on Fidelity yesterday, though you couldn't buy it. And um, more to come, but this is, as Alex said, this is 10 years in the making, a significant milestone in the crypto industry. And it's gonna op open up opportunities for institutional investors and consumers who had no other avenue, as well as those who just felt that crypto lacked a certain sort of endorsement to step their toe into the water of decentralized finance. Very exciting time. And we're going to talk about it today. So Alex, what do you think? Should we uh, hit, hit Gary's opinion first? Or do you just want to take a moment and reflect on what this means? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> get more into it as we get into more, you know, opinion sharing about the specifics around it. I think uh, some of the circumstances that led to the delays, that led to the ultimate approval, that led to rejections. Um, I definitely want to go through Hester's dissent. Um, 
because it was her most like vehement dissent. Excoriating. It was yet. wild. She did not pull any punches. Um, and it was, I don't know about you, Evan. I think it was one of the best written opinions from a government official that I've probably ever seen. And for context, uh, I have read quite a few um, dissenting and supporting opinions from the Supreme Court or from other agencies. Uh, when I was enlisted, we got lots of them from, especially while Trump was in office, because he would say something or his DHS secretary would say something and then everyone else would complain about it or whatever. So I've read a lot of them. And this was by far the best one I think I've ever read. So I'm excited to go through that. But ultimately what I think this means is this might be a hot take, I guess there's, it's controversial, right? You know, whether or not these ETFs are a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think generally, if you want the industry to be considered as legitimate as everyone who's here probably wants it to be, this was inevitable. I don't think there is any world in which crypto specifically Bitcoin here got as big as we all wanted it to via mass adoption or whatever. And there was not a product like this offered, right? Like it would be, it would be ridiculous to think that we were going to get anywhere close to even little adoption and not have big companies like these 11 listing entities now get involved. Um, so I, this was inevitable, whether it's good or bad, this was inevitable. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the manner in which they approved it finally after all of the bullshit was embarrassing. And uh, yeah, it, it was embarrassing and inevitable because at, at the same time, like we knew it was coming, but it was terrible the road we had to take to get here. Uh, it took a long time. And uh, if you're uh, just seeing the news like uh, Crypto Luffy here, uh, yes, it's true. We have a Bitcoin ETF. Um, Eleven. So Eleven. welcome on in. Welcome on in. We're talking about it. Uh, you know, you, you are certainly not alone in feeling that way. And one need look no further than the responses to some of the posts that uh, Gary Gensler has made lately. Can we... Uh, can we back up real quick, though, to just briefly cover the flagrant market manipulation by the SEC like uh, two days ago with the preemptive announcement? Now, let me let me ask you, what do you do you have more context or insight on that? Because I still don't know if that was just an intern with sticky fingers or or a botched marketing, you know, execution. Somebody put it in Hootsuite for Friday and, it, you know, they posted it on Thursday. And it, sorry. Well, do you think it was manipulation? Yes. Okay. And I, do you think it was intentional or just negligent? Either way, someone should lose their job and Gary should be fired. <laughs> By someone, you mean Gary? I mean, whoever posted it should lose their job and then Gary should automatically lose it whether he posted it or not. Um. Luffy, I respect your opinion. I'm not going to waste any more of the show time talking about Pulse. I think we excessively shared our opinions about it. So you go do you and may the odds be ever in your favor, my friend. Um, <clears throat> the So listen, the timing of that, it's, I don't know, I think it's obvious. There's no like concrete proof and we will probably never get it. But the timing of it, the wording of the tweet, it, it seems like a likely scenario is that they drafted that thing up and then someone pulled the trigger before they should have, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that really the, the points about it are that they knew what an announcement like that would do. One, it's insane to think that they were like prepared to announce anything via social media. Um, this, this has been my longstanding opinion about the SEC and market manipulation is that Gary is refusing to give people access and safe means to get involved with stuff, but he's not pulling any punches with regards to sharing things that he knows 
will alter the market trajectory, things that will have a, an immediate price impact on these assets that people are investing in. Yeah. So out of one side of his mouth, he's decrying the industry as a whole collectively because of its volatility and its you know insecurity and all of this other crap. And then out of the other side of his mouth, he's directly doing things that he knows are going to increase the volatility and the uncertainty inside of that market. So if he truly did not think it was a safe place, he would probably never talk about it, um, you know, until he actually had some sort of context or standing to talk about it with some sort of educated position. And my opinion of him has been just on a swan dive for a long, long time, because on one hand, he taught an incredibly informative course at MIT that is still relevant to this day and phenomenal. Uh, and then he's also overseen one of the most egregious tarnishings of an agency or government entity's reputation in the history of this country. Like if you were to put him on a playing field with the FBI's handling of Ruby Ridge or any other one of those multiple catastrophes, that director's handling of that tragedy did not tarnish the FBI's reputation in the same way that Gary Gensler has permanently scarred and tarnished the reputation of the SEC forever. Hester said it herself in her dissent that uh, we're going to talk about here in a little bit. There is no reason for a consumer to trust that the SEC has their best interests at heart anymore, and there hasn't been for a long time, because they were choosing with their own biased opinions, what investments were good and what ones were not. They were not allowing consumers to make those decisions from a protected standpoint or whatever. Their method of protection was simply to revoke access and hurt anyone who tried to experiment with something. Um, so I just, at the end of the day, regardless of how it ended or whatever, I guess in, in summation here, Gary has the case for Gary to be fired, I think is stronger than ever. And if they ever want the SEC to be taken seriously again, a strong stance needs to be taken against him and remove him from the position because the dude is, is completely ineffective. And no matter what, even if he were to do a complete polar, you know, a 180 tomorrow and be like, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've blah, blah, blah. Like the ideal way that he could respond to all this, the only thing, um, that's not really true. Congress could do it if they decided to get their shit together. Um, yeah, they can. There's almost no unilateral government uh, actions that have no other way to be influenced. Um, firing one guy is certainly not solely on the president's shoulders. He could do it easily. And, you know, he's probably not going to because uh, it would be a, a loss or whatever because he appointed him. But, you know. You know, when I first became aware of um, Gary Gensler and in, in just common parlance was when not not just the MIT course, but as a regulator was the um, was the GameStop um, or AM, AMC can't think about it um, that he made the proposals to change uh, the infrastructure there. And I remember uh, people in Congress are upset about it. I remember everybody on, you know, Wall Street and not Wall Street was upset about it. And I was like, oh, who is this guy? And then I was like, oh, this is the guy, Gary. I didn't put two and two together about him being the guy who taught the blockchain course yep. until way later. Like, I didn't even recognize it was the same guy. And then I started to get a lot of cognitive dissonance because he was just left and right at every opportunity. We've seen him we, as you say, I think I think what you say is really prescient. I just want to underscore: um, here is somebody who, at once, champions this idea of keeping investors safe, and seems to misunderstand the power of his own words to actually cause risk and danger for people. Um, yeah, it's it's repeatedly. Repeated. It, it's the fact that he he did it once, saw its effects, and then continued to do it for years. That's that's really the the crux of my beef with him. Yeah, and if I had to look at it from like a 
they're, they're never going to cover this in the crisis PR news. So I got to do it for the crypto industry. I would say the number one thing he could have done um, to make it different. And the number one thing anybody has got to do to repair the trust is they've got to do more to actively listen to and then broadcast that they are listening to stakeholders who look more like us. If you go to that man's Twitter, Alex, <laughs> we always joke about it. He is constantly, you would say, getting ratioed by everyday investors like you and I. He has the worst like view to like ratio of anyone I've ever seen. And it is because he doesn't take a lot of audiences with investors. If he does, he certainly doesn't do it publicly. It would help his image tremendously if he would take an audience with everyday people. Nothing's going to help Gary's image at this point, but restoration. I agree with Alex. He's got to go. Somebody else needs to step in. But if the SEC is going to repair its image, they're going to need somebody at the wheel like Hester, who is willing to criticize the agency, who lends their ear to every one of their stakeholders, not just Wall Street, um, and then acknowledges that that is a problem with their legacy that they're going to have to deal with. I think that's the only way, and I do think that is a path. I think the SEC could become a partner with us, you know, the people on the ground in the crypto industry, uh, everyday investors, institutional investors, to do an actually effective job, but it's a missed opportunity. And, uh, and, and Hester, like you said, she calls it that. That, that. that was the most scathing, excoriating response to an opinion I've ever seen. Yep. It was yes, I've I've read a lot of really vitriolic dissenting opinions before out of big Supreme Court cases, and none of them have ever plunged and then continued to twist the knife quite as aggressively as this one, while still writing it with every lick of professionalism that is required to be taken seriously. Uh, hey, real quick, we got a comment from Brightside Smile. I, uh, you mentioned Kathy Wood. ARC held a live yesterday after the news, and they had a number of people from their staff, a couple of folks from the industry. I know they had Anthony uh, Pompliano, and they had, uh, I did not know they had Elon on. I listened to it a little bit, and I was going to give my takes on some of the stuff she said, uh, but I mentioned that to say, what did Elon say? Um, I, I didn't see that or hear it at all. Did you listen to it, Alex? I didn't listen to it, but I've seen some news about it, um, so it's interesting. I'd like to hear hear whatever he said that was not yeah. in support of it because the at least the and maybe this is a fact check the article that I was um, reading one that I actually had highlighted to go over today was uh, this one right here um, let's see that Elon Musk is quote open to the idea of using Bitcoin on X. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, not only did uh, did X withdraw its. Um what did they do? They withdrew very quietly support for NFT profile pictures. And I've heard that they're changing yep. some of the rails with regards to their plans for crypto payments too. So I've heard both sides of the fence on this one. He said, yeah, he, he his, the quotes here are, um, he doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about Bitcoin. However, he's open to the idea of using it on X. It's like gold. It's not good for payments. Uh, he talked about his personal and SpaceX's investments in cryptocurrencies. He owns a lot of Dogecoin. Go figure. Ah, and Brightside Smile says he spoke about the issues of being slow and not much utility. Yeah. So that would that would make it, sense. Which I mean, it's a, it's obnoxious. This, I don't take anything Elon Musk says very seriously because he and, and he'll be the first to probably tell you that he just talks to talk. He just likes to hear the sound of his own voice, um, and he's got a, he's got enough money to where he can do whatever the fuck he wants and. He can say whatever he wants, it, it'll affect markets, and he'll still be a multi, multi, multi billionaire more than you could ever fathom. So it doesn't matter. A meme in his own time. Yeah. I mean, he, he's not an idiot. He knows exactly what he's doing. If he, if he says something, it's probably to create an opportunity for himself because that's what he does. He's an opportunist. Uh, any, anyone who's whining about Bitcoin's speed and utility just doesn't understand what it's supposed to do and what it was for, which is, that's fine. You don't have to get it. But like, well, it's frustrating be that because it's Elon, uh, it's kind of like because it's the SEC, sure. because it's Elon and he's saying it, a lot of people who don't know any better um, are, are just going to take him at face value. And I mean, I, I get it. You know, the, that's a tale as old as time, an uneducated influencer making an opinion that the, you know, also uneducated masses then just take at face value. 
hey, but we wouldn't know anything about that, would we? I just made a video yesterday saying, uh, come to the Rise Up Morning Show. We're not afraid to tell you we don't know. Uh, But of course, as Alex likes to say, we are just two strangers sharing their opinions on the internet. So thank you for joining us. Um, I see we got a lot of friends in the chat. Tommy's here. Um, I know uh, Jim is here. Let me me back up real quick because Jim asked about MicroStrategy and um, we skipped it. And let me just say about micro strategy really quick. We're going to get into Gary's opinion. We're going to get into Hester's opinion. We're going to unpack this thing. We're going to take our time going through this. But Kathy Wood did say yesterday on that Twitter space that they were going to have another live conversation. She didn't say when, but it sounded like soon with Michael Saylor to get his opinion and his feedback on what what went down. So if you're not, um, get on Twitter, sign up for an account just to stay abreast of crypto news and catch live events like that because... When folks like Michael Saylor go live, they tend to do it on Twitter. Yeah. So what did we miss um, from Jim? Just with re- so Jim was asking with all of these new products, basically like you know why would anyone look at MicroStrategy over the rest of them? You know what what's the case for investing in MicroStrategy? And I certainly can't give you a case to invest in anything. Uh, but as if I was trying to figure out for myself like which one meant more to me. I think that the ETFs existing is a good sign. So there's a lot of people that, you know, would exclusively use that. I've heard many people say, you know, like, uh, if I can't get it through Fidelity, I don't really care and I'm not interested. Yep. So, yeah, and that's not, that's a shared sentiment amongst many people um, with regards to a tremendous number of these entities that are now offering this product. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, however, I also would not stand here and pontificate about the wonders of an ETF approval mm-hmm. while not also saying that I don't think that these entities that are now selling these things are down with the message of decentralization <laughs> or the true ethos of Web3 and cryptocurrency. No, and just, they're like that Steve Buscemi meme with the skateboard where he's like, hello, yeah. fellow kids. Exactly. That's exactly what it's like. Um, I would not, I would never like, you know, assume what Satoshi would say if he could see it now, uh, if, if they could see it now, whoever they are. But I have to think that someone who created something like this probably could envision the world, you know, in which like a lot of people wanted to be involved with this thing. So it wouldn't be a surprise, but I guess that would be my only real case for micro strategy would be that maybe if, at, if looking at all of these entities and these individuals that, that chair them, you might think that Michael Saylor is more down with the ethos of Web3 and more of a true fan and believer in what Bitcoin is and what Bitcoin is supposed to do and why it exists and all of that stuff. And you might just feel better about being involved with Bitcoin via a group like MicroStrategy versus one like Van Eck, who is, as we know, just jumping on the bandwagon. We got a great question about our 401ks. Will either of you personally shift any assets from your 401k into an ETF? And I'll go ahead and very quickly answer it and tell you that I uh, don't actively, uh, I, I need to. Um, I use my 401k for, for mutual funds, for ETFs that are traditional finance to diversify my exposure because I am heavy crypto. I'm a low net worth individual compared to Michael Saylor, compared to pretty much anybody. And my goal very much is, um, you know, accumulate, diversify and, and, you know, high risk. I'm pretty aggressive. I, I, as an example, you know, I moved a lot of money one time into, um, like graphics and GPUs and computers when nobody was into that microvision NVIDIA at a time when now I don't have any exposure to NVIDIA. Uh, I rode that cow to the bank, along with a lot of others that 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 didn't go anywhere. That's kind of my personal strategy until I get to a point where I have a lot more assets that I want to protect, and then I'm going to be more conservative. And I almost certainly would, if my 401k gets large enough to diversify in that way, get some. Because um, while I believe in the value of holding Bitcoin free and clear, not your keys, not your crypto, I do think there are some advantages to... Um, if I've got to put money in a 401k, like that's money that say my employer is going to match, for example, and my other investment goals for different kinds of assets are met, why wouldn't I personally be me want more Bitcoin? I would. Uh, and I would be fine with somebody like Fidelity custodying that portion of the Bitcoin I own versus, you know, the stuff that's in my hardware wallet. Yeah. What about you? Would you do it? I would do it. Um, I'm not in a, you know, I'm not in a huge hurry. Uh, I do own 
uh, in my IRA or via my IRA rather shares of um, the grayscale trust I have for a long, long time. That's right. Um, <clears throat> I was doing for a little bit. I was trading cause it was lagging. So I was like kind of within the confines of my IRA. I was like trading um, the Bitcoin trust shares because you know, it was a little bit in uh, behind the curve of, of Bitcoin. So you could sort of like, you know, arbitrage a little bit that way as, yeah, as sure. Bitcoin is doing stuff, but I don't do that anymore. And I just, and now I just kind of, I have a little, actually it's probably the biggest single allocation outside of um, an S and P 500 index fund in my IRA is, is probably the grayscale Bitcoin trust. There's a few like individual stock holdings in there, but they're not that interesting. Uh, and same thing like you, there was one that um, kind of got me into investing a long time ago. I don't even remember the name of it. It was like a, it was some soul ascent, ascent solar. Um, and, uh, if anyone feels like a, a little, little fun moment, just look up the price chart of Ascent solar, because they were like a penny, it's a penny stock. And I just remember like kind of lightly getting into the idea of wanting to invest more. And this was years ago. This was like in 2014 or 15 or something like that. I, I don't even remember. No, no, no. It wasn't that early. 16, 2016. And, uh, I saw this thing and I was like, oh, this stock is cheap as hell. Um, I, I had just had this fresh, you know, IRA account, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll grab a little bit of that. And then I was just like reading the news one day and it was, you know, that phenomenon, Evan, you probably know the name of it. I, I don't remember the name, but like where you don't notice something until you have a reason to notice it. And then you see it everywhere. You know, like you, you buy a Silverado and all of a sudden you notice that everyone on the road is driving a Silverado. I would call it serendipity, but I bet there's a more specific word there, for it. There is a specific word for the, maybe someone can help me out here. Yeah. There, let us know. Oh, the, the dog is uh, running early this morning. It's only 8.30 and he's already... Um, there, there's a word for it, I know. Um, <clears throat> but... Is, bright side, is that it? Because that sounds legitimate and, and hefty. That could, that I, could... no, I don't think that's it. I, well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to discount you, but that, I, I think you're looking for something more colloquial. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's not. It's, a, it's the name of like a legitimate phenomenon that it's like a... I don't know. I don't remember. I'll look it up later unless someone can help me out. But the point is that um, I was just like reading the news and there was just this headline for Ascent Solar getting this massive patent deal uh, or potential patent deal. I don't even know if it ever went through from NASA to develop um, because their whole thing was like flexible solar panels. And it was like, yeah, you know, NASA is going to use them on the space shuttle. And that stock just exploded. And all of a sudden, like, the you know a thousand bucks that i had put into it was like 11 or 12 grand yeah and i was just like what just happened and um i was new and i did not know what i was doing so i barely sold any of it and that stuff is cheaper than ever now and it crashed all the way back down into the toilet um i don't think i even necessarily knew at that time just that like you could trade within the confines of an ira so yeah uh, Thank you, so Brett. that is it. Bader Meinhof, also yep. called frequency illusion. The uh, the reticulated activating oh. system, the reticular activating system, it's a component in your brain. Uh, it's in your brain stem, and I'm looking it up. But it regulates sleep wake transitions in consciousness. I, I, I'm not sure if it uh, if it if it is part of that noticing. You, you know, somebody commented too about this ETF. Would you hold it in your? Uh, I think it was Brightside, mm -hmm. saying. Um, you, you can't use it the way you would use an asset you own free and clear to leverage. And that's an interesting point about crypto specifically. You might have said, well, what's the point? Nobody accepts my leverage for crypto for anything. But we were at a conference three years ago and somebody was introducing an instrument that had been in, approved in at least Florida where you could leverage your Bitcoin to get a mortgage, um, yeah. go buy a house. It was a totally new type of financial agreement. And I definitely think, you know, people talk about that in DeFi all the time, micro loans, um, leverage staking, et cetera, et cetera. I absolutely think people are going to want to use cryptocurrency to do that kind of thing because it natively is very good for it. And they're going to also be more friendly after this ETF about using it in that way. Um, I think that's one of the things I think is really good about this ETF is it's going to make other people 
who might use crypto for different kinds of traditional financial instruments that it could do better, a little less worried about at least Bitcoin, um, especially if Fidelity's holding it. You know what I mean? Um, um, this is interesting. Anime Fanboy says, bro, I don't care. Before Alex tells me what's interesting, if you don't care, I gotta say thank you for helping the algorithm. If you have something to say, if you got a, an itchy thumb, go ahead and tap the screen. We are here doing helpful news, commentary, and answers to your crypto question from our experience as founders in the blockchain industry. We are never gonna tell you anything that we don't know the answer to. We're never gonna try and sell you anything, tell you what to buy, and we are here to help you get in touch with a better story about crypto. So, so help us out in return. Leave a comment like that, even if you're a hater. We love it. What is interesting, Alex? Uh, Circle is applying for an IPO. It's just going to open a floodgate, dude. Everyone's okay. going to just try and see what they can get away with. That's my that's my new theory. Is after the ETF, Circle's going to apply for an IP, IP. What do you think about it? You think they'll get approved? IPOs have been kind of de, you know not very de rigueur in a couple of years. Um, I think if Coinbase can get an IPO, that Circle can get one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, right side, that that's accurate. We're, that's not exactly what we were saying. I didn't mean to. We didn't mean to muddy the waters or confuse that talking point at all. Uh, but yes, correct. If you are purchasing uh, shares of an exchange traded fund via any of the newly approved sellers, uh, retailers of these funds, you are not purchasing your own Bitcoin that you custody. Right. You can go to one of the crypto exchanges. Coinbase, Kraken, whatever, you can buy Bitcoin there and withdraw it to your own uh, wallet, and then you can custody your own Bitcoin that way, uh, which is one of the options. But uh, obviously, what you actually own is almost like a token. It's like yeah. a share. Yeah, you it are is worth Bitcoin. They're holding for you. Yeah, the ETF is much more akin to purchasing stock in a company. You don't actually own that. Like you don't possess the thing that it is, you know, like you on paper own it and a, an, an agency is allowing you to own it. Um, so it's certainly not the same thing. You're buying the right to it, uh, which theoretically can be revoked, which is why crypto diehards are not a big one. <laughs> Look at this. Are the ETFs FDIC insured? What if Fidelity hires Gary Gensler's intern and loses the keys? <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree with Brightside. The single tier uh, is my only. <laughs> um, no, but that is a really good question. ETF shares are not insured by the FDIC. It it insures deposits held in banks. And let me see. Uh, this insurance does not extend to financial products like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or cryptocurrency assets. So your ETFs. Well. But that depends a little bit too on the on the holding entity because like um, some of the bigger exchanges do offer like up to a limit FDIC insurance of customer accounts. Um, even like Coinbase or Crack, that was Kraken's whole big thing for a while that they did offer an FDIC insurance like allotment. Um, right, right. There was yeah. a whole lot of like stipulations though on it, and even even just blanket like one of the most alarming things I think I ever saw was. Uh, just like the list of things that are not covered by FDIC insurance, uh, even if what you have is covered. Uh, and it was just like, basically, there's almost nothing in there to protect you from getting scammed. Like if you get scammed and your money gets stolen, you're just kind of shit out of luck, which I thought was wild. Yeah. Um, do you did you have a an Elon article? Am I forgetting that? And and do you want to hear Gary's opinion? I, I feel like we got to give the people the opinions in a second. I think we should. Yeah, I mean, I, personally, we should cover it. Personally, I don't give a shit what his opinion is because I don't respect anything he has to say anymore. But uh, for the sake of for the sake of covering all the bases, doing the news, let's let's give that asshole a little bit more airtime. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said we are on crypto talk, baby. <laughs> yeah, welcome to crypto talk. No bros here, although Alex is. My brother from another mother, uh, and we do have the same glasses frames. But uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have about cryptocurrency. And if you want to, then join the conversation on our Discord server. It's totally free. It always will be. Discord.gg slash the many. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday doing this, trying to build a community with you, tell a better story, 
because we are the faceless many, the everyday people who will rise up and tell a better story about crypto. And if you do want to buy something from us, this is the only thing I'm going to sell you. You can support the show by getting your very own Rise Up Morning Show mug. And if you buy one, you might just find that there's a, a little extra something in there. There may or may not be an NFT attached because Evan. can you prove you own it? What? I, th I think I think we should plan and announce and uh, uh, Jimothy, yes, 11 of them. 11 of them were passed. Actually, despite the false alarm. I thought it was 10. It's 11. There's 11. Who's number 11? Yep. It's like the eighth <clears throat> dwarf. He just got left out in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was just gonna say I think I think we should like we should come up with the parameters for and do the like viewer uh, contest to get Kyo to design them their own custom ghoul on a mug, and then uh, do that because uh, yeah. I could we could definitely get Kyo to to whip up a a custom ghoul design. Oh, that would be fantastic! So so if you do want to buy a mug to support the show, I I am actually I used to say get them on my TikTok shop. I still can't figure that thing out. So if you if you happen to, you can go to, uh, I have a website, conversationswithevan.com. You can find it through my profile. And uh, if you don't, we don't care. We still love you. The show's still going to be here. Uh, but that's a great way to support. Your coffee just won't taste as good. Ohio. Hmm? Your coffee just won't taste as good. Your coffee okay. absolutely will not taste as good as if you put it in the Rise Up Morning Show mug. Every time you buy a mug, uh, a, a meme coin goes to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I was going to say, since no, since nobody will sponsor us, we're sponsoring ourselves with our mugs. Hey, and, uh, that, I, I ta I, I'm about to reach out to that company that uh, sent Mac that little thing um, so that now yeah. everybody will know where his seed phrase is, but they'll you know, never be able to destroy it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I got a kick out of thinking that, you know, some people keep their seed phrases uh, stored in their safe. And I think I lost Evan. And Mac keeps his in a holster on his belt now, which is very funny to me. I'm not sure if uh, if I got lost or if Evan got lost, but uh, someone can let me know whether or not you can still hear me or not. Um, absolutely, Vanna. We will. We're right now. So right now, what we're going to do, just because it is ECF day, um, is we're going to talk about the two. The two. Okay, Evan got lost. All right, he'll be back. So the first one from Gary himself, and the second, the good one, the fun one, uh, from Hester Pierce, who is the crypto mom. She's she's the 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 voice of reason within the SEC, and it is an absolutely scathing uh, opinion from from Hester. So we're going to talk about that. But just to break down, welcome back, Evan. Thank you very much. I was lost in the metaverse, but I'm with you. <laughs> to break down uh, the ETF approval to a beginner. Just in a in a little nutshell here, what does this mean? This means that the regulating and uh, authority enforcing body inside of the United States, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commissions, which are supposed to protect investors, um, they have approved finally after many many years uh, eleven spot Bitcoin ETF applications. Uh, what that means is that now through these eleven uh, holding entities, uh, I don't remember the entire list, but it's Vanek, ARK, Fidelity, BlackRock, a couple others. Banks you um, know and trust. Yeah, big big financial institutions, banks, the places where most people's retirement accounts are through. You can now purchase spot Bitcoin, meaning not the, the Bitcoin trust from Grayscale like we used to have. Literally, like you make a purchase, they buy Bitcoin on your behalf, they custody it, you have exposure to the actual asset through their fund. Uh, as one of our viewers pointed out earlier, this is not you owning Bitcoin. You do not own the Bitcoin. You're earning, you're, you're owning a share of it and the company holding the ETF that you purchased is holding the Bitcoin uh, on your behalf. So the reason that it's a big thing is because lots of people have been kept out of toe dipping into Bitcoin exposure uh, because of the complicated buying process, the risks of self-custody, uh, the sketchy nature of using cryptocurrency exchanges, all that sort of stuff. So this is looked at by many, including myself, as a good thing overall because it will give people who would like access but don't want to self-custody all of their own stuff 
and assume all of that risk and that security responsibility for themselves uh, to get exposure to a new asset class. Um, and as I love to remind people, I totally understand why some people would not be enthused by this because it is not in line with the ethos that is Web3 and the ethos that is Bitcoin, which is your keys, your crypto, you own it, it's your property, it's yours, you custody it, it's trustless, peer to peer, me and Evan don't need a middleman to send each other money, we can do it via Bitcoin and the blockchain easily, cheaply, efficiently and quickly in pretty much any amount. Uh, I totally get that. And I completely agree with you that ETFs are not in line with that original ethos. However, the opportunity for you to purchase your own Bitcoin and self custody it yourself is not being taken away. You can still do that via Coinbase, Kraken, Binance, whatever, any of them, buy it there, withdraw it to your own wallet. Um, and two, no one can force you to sell your Bitcoin. So if you have some and you're upset about this, about Vanek buying up all the Bitcoin or BlackRock buying up all the Bitcoin, they can only do that as long as we keep selling it to them. So just remember that you do actually have more power than you think you do here. Uh, and that is one of the ways that these not to not to soapbox or stump speech here, but that's one of the ways that these big entities maintain their control and power uh, is because they work very hard to convince you that you actually have no power uh, and you have a lot more than you think you do. You just have to exercise it. So just keep that in mind. If you own Bitcoin, I own Bitcoin. I'm not going to sell my Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to keep it because I prefer to own it myself. Uh, but overall, this is a this is a good thing, in my humble opinion. Yeah, and I would just simply add that while there are some really valid reasons to be concerned about the approval of an ETF, this is going to democratize access to Bitcoin for people who are not very technological, for whom the blockchain is this like weird amorphous place. Um, a hardware or software wallet seems really scary. The responsibility of self custody may not be realistic. It's and intimidating. It's, it's intimidating and it is a big responsibility. These people, so far as we know, I, you know, <laughs> a lot of folks watching this are skeptical of big banks, governments and institutions, but the vetting process to get an ETF, the kind of accountability you have to have to become fidelity in the first place means that they're going to have rails and safeguards in place to ensure they don't hire an intern like Gary Gensler's who just, you know, tweets out your password. Um, they are a single point, therefore more susceptible to attack. But I truly believe that the existence of this is going to really take a lot of the fear out of an instrument like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. not only going to give people access to it for the first time, it's going to help them start to understand the benefits of truly decentralized currency. Some of these people are going to get Bitcoin just because they can and want to diversify. But then they're going to start to learn about it because they have a vested interest in it. Yeah. They're going to understand the difference between the Bitcoin that their ETF gives them a right to and the Bitcoin someone like me holds free and clear. The different kinds of properties it has that are different from traditional money and the valid reasons for the existence of a global decentralized permissionless currency and from there once they experience those benefits i i think that's going to be huge because they will come to demand them that'll be great for crypto and that's for the adoption of the technology just you know beyond bitcoin that's a really really good point evan that i i did not mention um I, I want to get to a couple of these questions because there's some really good ones. Yeah, we just got some good feedback. Asked, this is but, a great conversation today. Uh, Evan, your point that you just made, I just want to reiterate. Sure. sure. You said sure. that another reason that this is a good thing is even if you don't intend to purchase your Bitcoin via one of these exchange traded products through one of these big banks, this might signal to you that it is a more secure decision to get some and you might feel better about learning how to get it yourself and not necessarily use this as you know the way in but indication that it is a little bit safer now than it was before to toe dip and get some bitcoin exposure um so let me just hit a couple of these questions um let's scale back up a little bit here um will this bring uh, regulation to the crypto sector we hope so 
Um, that is one of the things that we're going to cover when we talk about Hester's opinion, because she really, I think, hit that nail squarely on the head. Um, do, 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 do. Um, somebody asked about, um, I'm looking to answer the Cash App question right now, because I don't remember if Cash App is, is self-custody or not. And I can't I was gonna, quick, uh, just yep. on that. Real quick, though, to... to Jimothy asking if we were going to see a sizable pullback or correction anytime soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Evan and I are not in the business of making price predictions. Uh, I don't have a basis or foundation to make a price prediction, so I don't do it. Um, my personal opinion is I would, it would be weird, I think, if we didn't. Uh, I mean, we saw what happened, uh, was it two days ago when they falsely announced the ETF approval, right? Like huge candle battle, right? A big spike up, and then they were like, no, it's fake huge spike down, you know, Bitcoin fluctuated by like almost $5,000 within that single candle, which is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, so we've already proof, seen a lot of pullback. Yeah, proof, proof if, if of nothing else uh, of Bitcoin's still being a volatile asset, right? So it would be insane if it was only up from here. Uh, the other thing to remember is that this is a volatile asset and one of the ways that people make money off of volatile assets is trading the ups and trading the downs so if these gigantic financial institutions who have a very strong interest in making money for themselves and their their clients and their shareholders are now into this thing they're not going to be upset if it goes up or down and i think we still have the risk uh, of market manipulation i don't think that is just magically going to go away so i'm sure that we will see spikes up and wicks down um, I just, you know, I don't have a foundation to like predict when that's going to happen. No one really does. Um, there are better guessers than, than others, I guess, but, uh, yeah, so possible, but you know, that's just my opinion. It, it means exactly what you think it means. So let me, I, I agree completely with Alex and I'm equipped to answer. Can I answer the cash app question? Please. Yep. That was my next so, one. Um, when you buy Bitcoin through cash app, you have now full custody over it. They actually worked with Coinbase to implement a self-custody system. What does that mean, self-custody? If I buy Bitcoin on Robinhood, isn't it the same as buying Bitcoin on you know any other website? No, not entirely. As Alex explained about the ETF, when you buy Bitcoin on a platform that does what's called custodying it for you, you know, they are the custodian. They own Bitcoin. What you own is a right to access that Bitcoin. But just like an ETF, it's sort of a delayed access that is facilitated by a middleman. In this case, you know, Grayscale, Fidelity, BlackRock, whatever. And the disadvantage of that, the advantage of that is you don't have to, you know, keep a wallet somewhere that if you lose, you lose your crypto. They do that for you. The disadvantage of that is if the market moves or you start to feel differently about your investment and you want to sell it or you want to send somebody money, you have to go through them. And if they're closed or their system is down, or they're investigating your profile, um, that means you might have to wait. You gotta play by their terms. Platforms like Venmo, Webull, Robinhood, it varies. Some of them are uh, self custody and some of them are not. Uh, Venmo and Robinhood historically did not offer the ability for you to custody your own crypto and transfer your assets off the platform. Um, but generally speaking, most of these institutions are looking for ways to implement it. Cash App has implemented it. It's, it's through Coinbase. When you buy Bitcoin on Cash App, you, you get a, a wallet. You can transfer it anytime. It's yours free and clear. Though, because it is managed through the interface of the app, if you're using the app to access it and the app goes down, you know you may have some problems there. The, yep. the best way to own free and clear your digital tokenized assets is to get a hardware wallet. A little USB type device. If you Google hardware wallet, you can look some up that are reputable, Ledger, Trezor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that ensures that even if the internet goes down, you will have the ability to access, transfer, sell your crypto. Sorry, yeah, so the, the Cash App wallet is is hot. That would be the, the term for it, connected to the internet. And that might uh, be good to say, you know, hot and cold. Yeah. Mm. Couple, couple different kinds of wallets there, but to, to Evan's point, just to summarize there, there's a few different ways that you can get access to Bitcoin. Now that we have these ETFs, there is an, a new way, right? Which is, uh, so before I guess the, the least extreme would probably have been the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. There was a couple other like, 
you know, exchange traded products that were not spot, they were, you know, share or whatever. Um, that is like the least web three version, right? Like you purchase a share from a company who then does something on your behalf and you get some access to it, whatever. Then now we have these ETFs. So I can buy a share of the spot asset, which the company holds and manages for me. Uh, or I can go to one of these other places like uh, Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, whatever, and purchase crypto there, which is a little bit more yours because you can make the decision to withdraw it at whatever point you would like, as long as the exchange is operational and put it somewhere else. Uh, but until you do that, they will custody it for you. Uh, and then you've got, you know, probably the other products, I guess, you know, that uh, would allow you to just have it on your own device and on your own wallet, whether it's a hot wallet or a, um, a cold wallet, regardless. And, and this, this uh, comment, don't buy it on Amazon. You should always buy any kind of hardware wallet storage solution directly from the manufacturer. Double check every link, every website. People will try to scam you that way. That is the safest way. But the caveat to that, and I specifically asked Ledger about this last year when we were talking to um, Katie about Hope trying to get a Ledger sponsorship for TFM. Uh, Ledger has on their website a list of approved retailers, and you can actually, the Amazon example is, is a funny one, because oh. you, you can actually, Best Buy is another one, actually. Best Buy will sell, uh, they're an authorized retailer of Ledger devices, not every store, but some of them have them, uh, and Amazon as well has a direct connection via the Amazon storefront to the ledger manufacturer. Um, so do not, yeah, don't, I mean, nothing refurbished. Don't just go to Amazon and search it is what you're saying. Yeah, the safest way is to just buy it directly from Ledger or from Trezor or from LAPAL or from Arculus or whichever manufacturer you're interested in getting a wallet from. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch. Um, but there are becoming now some more retailer. I wouldn't buy one on Facebook Marketplace, you know, but, um, it is it is worth reading just to go look at like Ledger's website and see their list of approved retailers because there are a few, yeah. um, and that's directly from Ledger. That like you know, Katie was literally like, no, it's you know, we're trying to get out in front of this messaging thing. You know, I totally get it, whatever. But like, it is all right to buy a Ledger device from an authorized retailer. But I would still go through personally. I would still go through the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Alex. Uh, what do you think? Yes. Do you think we've teased it enough? Is it time for a, uh, for a, uh, we keep, we keep dancing around it. Yeah. Let's do it for the opinions. Yep. Um, then let's talk about it. Um, before, before my, before my waxy butt comes into the conversation, somebody's in the comments asking about that. And, uh, I'm just, I'm just going to type. I've got, <laughs> I've got a fresh, soft <laughs> skin on the heart. <laughs> Not to <laughs> not trying to derail the show by talking about my waxing today. Uh, I'll give you a waxing update at the end. If you want to see it, stick around. Uh, if the show gets to 10,000 likes, I will give you the 30 second update on my butt waxing and reveal whether or not it is in fact itchy. So make that happen and we'll talk about it. But for now, Alex, uh, yeah. should we, should we just dive into these two? Let's, let's start with Gary. Of start with Gary. Let's start with Gary. Okay. Um, I do not have the summary. I do have the full statement in front of me and the yep. quote um, that I will pass it to you with to say, do you want to do you want to do the whole thing or not is while we approved the listing, we did not approve or endorse Bitcoin. It sounded like a kid dragged by his mother kicking and screaming to play with the other kids. Yep. I just that's not a distinction he needed to make. No, it was completely unnecessary. He's he's he was he was outmaneuvered and outvoted and finally backed far enough into a corner where he had no choice to continue to derail and you know ruin everyone's time in the sun. And frankly, uh, outclassed. Yeah. I mean literally that that behavior is behavior that like my 10-year-old would say after I finally harassed him into brushing his teeth. Be like, "Oh, well, I'll do it. I don't want to." Okay, really mature. Um, well done from the head of the three letter agency. I'm, I'm really enthused by your leadership. Yeah, he in his statement, he gives a lot of, you know, clarification about what this means logistically, you know, for crypto for Bitcoin for investors. 
um, which is maybe the most helpful part of this thing. But he says, this, this is something I, I thought was, was he says, though we're merit neutral, what a phrase that is, I'd note that the underlying assets have consumer and industrial uses in other like gold ETPs. While in contrast, Bitcoin is primarily a speculative volatile asset that's also used for illicit activity. And he goes on to list and cite the illegal activity it's used for. While we are approving the listing, we did not approve or endorse Bitcoin. Investors should remain cautious about the myriad risks associated with Bitcoin and products whose value is tied to crypto. And I just want to say, this is the perfect example of what you called him out for. It is his job to endorse, not to endorse anything, to outline risks. But the language he's using there to do that versus the language he's used in the past for any other asset, it's just not the same. It's, it's so irresponsible. Like, why'd you even approve it if you, if you think it, this is all it's for, brother? You know, like, it's exactly what you said, man. I just, he, he is making the case every single day for his termination, demonstrating that he's not fit to lead that agency. And the people responsible for keeping him there refuse to do anything about it. So we're just fostering an era of incompetence in this country, which is super on brand for the U.S. government, of course, but unfortunate for sure. Um, do, do you think, I, I mean, Elizabeth Warren or somebody is like, is actually yeah. happy about this statement like somebody somewhere is happy about this yeah i think you know i i think it's i wish that i understood elizabeth warren's motives i mean i think it's probably just as easy and simple as it sounds you know that she's greedy and she wants money and she's doing whatever it takes to like just put more cash in her pocket that's probably the what's the the name of the laws escaping me the simplest answer is is probably the, the one. Razor. thank you um yeah so that's probably the case um I think it's odd because you'd like to think so like I may really disagree with these people, but I don't think that they're stupid. Like Elizabeth Warren makes me deeply sad inside, but I don't think she's stupid. And I've always wondered how someone who can like purport to be a champion of the progressive narrative and opposed to the big banks can just constantly act in accordance with exactly what big banks would want you to do, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then just also like we know how much money she has and is worth and it just makes no sense. So I've, I've always been confused by that. Like the it's, it really just has to boil down to one, they're greedy and two, they truly believe that everyone watching them is completely stupid or they just know that no one can do anything to remove them from power. Like they're just that secure in their bad behavior um, because they keep getting rewarded with reelection repeatedly. Um, cause I mean, I, I, I guess I kind of get it. I'm exhausted by the whole thing. I love politics and I'm exhausted by it to the point where I see political news. And at this point, I don't even have the energy to read it. I'm just like, Oh, whatever, you know, um, you get that defeated feeling. So they cap, they, people like her capitalize on that defeatist attitude because they just get to stay in power and keep making money and doing whatever. But, uh, but no, I, I, I'm sure Evan, I'm sure there are people who are happy about Gary's opinion. I mean, there's gotta be right. Cause he still has a job. So. Yeah, it, it baffles me, though. And when you read Hester's opinion, it just like um, it really honestly. does sound like a 10 year old being dragged away from the sandbox crying while someone else is like, I gave him every chance he could have had his ice cream. If only yep. he did. you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, shall we get into the should we get into the good shit here and talk about Hester? Yeah. And would you mind terribly if I just read the whole thing? Because it's honestly, I could do it in 60 seconds which is one of my favorite things about it. He took four pages. She took one. Um, unless I'm, unless I'm not looking at the full statement, I'm looking you're at not. The There's, if oh. you could read this in 60 seconds, I'd be mind blown. Oh, it's huge. Okay. It's well, huge. Then, that means there's some that I haven't got to yet. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, would you like, would you like to read a passage that you found let particularly? Me, let compelling? me read a passage. Yes. Okay. This is from Hester Pierce. This, also this is like what we read to our, little crypto children before bed like this Hester's new opinion here should become like, you know, uh, say your go, go to your room. It's good time for bed. Say your prayers. And you just like recite Hester's dissenting opinion and go to bed. Yeah. I personally like to imagine Gary Gensler standing at a podium, very stiff, 
reading his opinion off a piece of paper to the press corps. And yep. after he finishes, and I'm sure he ends his speech with the words, thank you. He walks off stage <laughs> and then Hester just comes on. She Time out. Like, Time out. <sighs> It's just worth noting for everyone in the audience here that Evan telling someone that they probably ended a speech with with thank you is the single biggest burn that Evan will ever dish out to anybody. E nothing makes Evan think less of you than ending a speech with thank you. Yeah, you want to lose stature in my eyes, give a great speech, and then after your killer final line, <laughs> just say thank you and walk off stage. Like, yeah. <laughs> so that's I'm what Gary does. Continue. And then yeah. Hester walks in, she takes a deep breath, and I'm picturing she just it, like could deliver this off the top of her head. That's what I think of her. She says, we squandered a decade of opportunities to do yep. our job. If yep. we had applied the standard we use for other commodity-based ETBs, we would have approved these products years ago, but we refused to do it until a court called our bluff. And even now, approval only comes begrudgingly. Whoa. Perhaps the one silver lining here is now that we know the commission can execute a robust correlation analysis, perhaps the road to approving other crypto ETPs will not be as bumpy. A few more points she makes I want to give you. Today's order does not undo the many harms created by our disparate treatment of Bitcoin products. She calls it arbitrary, capricious. She says it will continue to harm our reputation far beyond crypto. Although this is a time for reflection, it is also a time for celebration. I am not celebrating Bitcoin or Bitcoin related products. She says, what I think is irrelevant. I am celebrating the right of American investors to express their thoughts on Bitcoin by buying and selling Bitcoin ETBs. Celebrating perseverance, I commend the applicant's decade long persistence in the face of the commissions. She calls it obstruction. Yep. No punches pulled. No holds barred. Whoa. <laughs> no, it's it's super well written. It takes a lot of skill, I think, to communicate like this much um, this much dissent without getting vulgar. Like it, it's just a, a very strong grasp of the English it's language. Marvelous. Yeah, it's really good. Um, there's a couple lines that really stuck out to me because these are things that we have all been collectively saying um, <clears throat> for for ages. I know I, I this is usually how I describe the process to anyone who's interested in learning more about it. Quote, the goalpost kept moving as the commission slapped denied on application after application, which is that that's exactly what it was. The yeah. they would receive a round of applications they would send them all back saying nope fix this exactly that would get fixed they'd send it back they would delay as long as possible and say okay here's a new let's move the goalpost again let's try again and they did that for 10 years um bitcoin based products have been trading for years under other regulatory regimes in 2017 for example the cme and the cboe which are regulated by the commodity futures trading commission listed bitcoin futures Foreign jurisdictions have long allowed spot Bitcoin ETPs to trade. The commission should have drawn comfort from the successful launch and smooth trading of these products, even though market stress and volatility, even through market stress and volatility. Instead, until today, the commission remains steadfast in its unwillingness to let spot Bitcoin ETPs into U.S. markets. Um, this is and this is another great point. This is a case for uh, like I mean, you can you can apply this logic to marijuana legalization or you know whatever you want it holds it holds water in the meantime the commission has driven retail investors to less efficient means of attaining bitcoin exposure through securities markets so if it's it's I'm, it's a little bit of a strange argument you know like um especially if, if you use it like in the context of parenthood or something like that but they're going to do it anyway you might as well do it in the house is yeah. basically what this is um you know if, if I think ultimately what it is, is if if the public has been making it clear repeatedly and for years that they want this and the government's j role and purpose is to be elected by to represent the people who are its voice and its reason for existence, then steadfast resistance to implementing the public's desire is exactly 
the opposite of what government is supposed to do. Yeah, Typically, so you get unelected. Well, in theory, right? But look at how many, there are so many examples of policy that are supported by 98% of people in this right. country that never see the light of day. Um, you know, granted that's on us to not elect properly, but you know, whatever. Can, that's I, can I respond to that point that Hester yeah. says, read, read that line again that she said, and I'm going to read another one of her lines that, that underscore the, just about, um, we have made them do oh. a thing. Yep. Um, hold on. I scrolled. Oh, in the meantime, the commission has driven retail investors to less efficient means of attaining Bitcoin exposure in the securities markets. Uh, yeah. She gives a few examples, but she says later in the in the document where I was reading that by failing to follow normal standards, normal processes, we have also created an artificial frenzy around them. She's saying that, like, because yeah. we didn't give people a good means to invest in this thing that we could help them with now. That is directly, we are directly responsible for, you know, the, the moon boys, the Lambos, the have fun staying poor people and all the scams and schemes that the SEC says are like rampant in crypto. She is, she is as a representative of the SEC saying more or less, no, that's our fault. Or at least we have a lot of culpability for it. So. Dude, it, it just it just keeps going. I'll I'll put the link to this in our in our Discord general chat because yeah. it is it is worth the time to read it. Um, if nothing else, but just to like demonstrate that there is a voice of reason like within the government, which is maybe a little bit of reassurance that we could all use from time to time. Yeah. Um, now we're getting a couple questions here. Do you mind if I real quick uh, invite people? Just reset it to say, hey, yep. hi Millie, hi everybody, welcome in. We're talking about the Bitcoin ETF. I'm Evan, he's Alex, we're co-founders in the crypto space. If you've never seen our faces before, but you're hearing a lot about crypto, this is a place where you can ask questions. We're not gonna try and sell you anything. We're gonna break it down nice and slow. And if you wanna keep the conversation going, you can join us every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. Central, 1 p.m. UTC, or head on over to our Discord server where, like Alex mentioned, we post links to this stuff. And, and, and you know, it's free. Just come hang out, talk with us, talk with other cool people in the, the movement we call the faceless many, the everyday people who will rise up with the power of this technology to write a better future. It is discord.gg slash the many. Discord.gg slash the many. And if you're crypto curious, like you're not even sure why this stuff matters to you personally, I'm gonna post another resource in there later today. Uh, Alex, I don't know if you know this, but um, Matt Levine, who's a finance writer for Business Week Bloomberg, he did an entire takeover recently of a Business Week magazine issue. Like the whole issue is the crypto story. And it, it's phenomenal. They also have it in audio form. If you're a podcast person, um, you can spend just a little bit of time listening or reading this excellent document. It assumes no prior knowledge and you're basically caught up. And from there, if you want to get in, you'll be more informed than 99% of all people. And if you don't want to get in, then you'll still be more informed than 99% of all people. Um, it's fantastic. And I'm going to post that there too. So one more time while Alex is typing it in the chat, it's discord.gg slash the many. We'd love to see you there. You know what I just realized? Uh, the, what? the title of Hester's statement. I didn't read it until right now. What's it say? Out, damn spot. Out, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Statement on the omnibus order, uh, approval order for list and trade spot Bitcoin based commodity based trust shares and trust units. So the we love a literary reference. Uh, I'm going to give you some context for anybody who doesn't know that is a line spoken by Lady Macbeth in the play Macbeth. Uh, oh. Through Lady Macbeth, William Shakespeare used out, damn spot, out. Uh, to give a voice to this feverish urgency she felt as she was cleaning up bloodstains caused by her husband, um, who was like wrecking the empire around them. So not only is it uh, appropriate for the Bitcoin spot ETF, it is a wonderful double entendre for somebody who is frustrated at the besmirching of their life by the person they're relying on the most. Yep. <laughs> oh my God, wow. Um, Rudo, this is one of the things we talked about earlier in the show. Um, yes, an ETF is not in line with the original ethos of Bitcoin. Uh, so there is 
upside and downside to this kind of product being approved. Um, so the, the nutshell of that is basically that yes, accurate. This is not probably the original method of acquisition that Satoshi envisioned for Bitcoin. Um, but two, this is an overall good thing, in my opinion, um, just because it signals to a skeptical public that it is a little bit more safe and secure and reasonable to think that I, you would like some Bitcoin exposure. So whether this is the impetus for you to acquire it yourself through means of self-custody or to get a little bit of exposure to kind of toe dip through one of these exchange traded products, um, it's, a good, it's a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing for crypto generally. Millie asked a couple comments above, you know, can we talk about how this is a good time for Solana? I think whether you are into, it's a great time as an investor, but also as somebody who is just trying to learn about what are the benefits of cryptocurrency, of blockchain, of decentralized currency. Um, I'll tell you what, if you were uh, holding some Ethereum or buying Ethereum a couple weeks ago before all the activity on the Ethereum network started, in anticipation of the Bitcoin ETF, you're you're doing well as a speculator. But also, if you are somebody who has been operating a node on the Ethereum computer, one of the world's biggest decentralized networks, you have probably gained more knowledge, insight, social capital, um, not to mention cryptocurrency, than just about anybody in the last five years. So it's a great time. You're not too late. Um, to be in crypto, in blockchain, learning about this stuff, even if you never spend a dollar on it, even if you never buy Bitcoin or the ETF. Elizabeth Warren is now indirectly accusing BlackRock, etc., as funding nebulous uses of Bitcoin. Yeah, I guess so, right? That's a good point. Yeah. And, and, and Brightside also said above, my favorite underrated comment in the chat, what an awkward day in the SEC lunchroom. Can you, like, it must be no secret between them, can you imagine what their interactions must be like day to day? They must really like and trust each other. It honestly makes me think I, of, like if we, you know how we have the situation room? I feel like there were times when we were doing stuff um, where like I would have pushback or you would have pushback and we would like, you know, have words back and forth that were always respectful, but were sometimes heated um, in terms of expressing very different opinions. And I mean, you know, I never ever have had like ill will towards, you know, you or Mac or Mahir or Joe or anybody, you know, but they're like the situation room in public and it's always, you know, I like, I like to imagine that, that Gary is, uh, too intimidated by Hester to say anything. Oh yeah. Hyper passive um, aggressive. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, good yeah. morning. Good Just morning. Talks Tasha. about everything but the issue. Yep. Um, Alex, we've uh, we've got some other questions here that we certainly can answer about uh, crypto. And Rudo asked, "What are our favorite categories?" Um, do you want to do you want to segue away from um, the ETF for a second, or do you have some other stuff you want to say about it? Uh, I was just going to say that in in summary of yeah. um, final thoughts. Yep. <clears throat> there's a, so there's a lot here. I put the link in the, in the general chat. It is worth reading. There's a lot more that, um, we haven't gone through. I'm going to film a longer video after the show here, uh, just about Hester's opinion completely. Um, but I really liked her closing, uh, basically, um, we have alienated a generation of product innovators within our space. Our unreasonable approach to these applications has signaled that regulatory prejudice against new products and services can lead us to sidestep the law and unreasonably delay product launches. The industry has logged hundreds of meetings, has filed submissions, withdrawals, and amendments, and ultimately had to resort to a costly legal battle to get us to today. Powerful, man. Yeah. It also says a lot that in every single time uh, that I've ever read Hester dissent, she always uses we and us. And I just think that says a lot about her character. Yeah. Just like constantly putting herself in the group, even though just like no one who is familiar with the inner workings of the SEC who has read these opinions before would ever like put her in the same category as Gary. Uh, but the fact that she just embraces, you know, like, where she works 
constantly and like owns her shared responsibility and everything that the agency does, I think says a lot. I agree a hundred percent. I think she's, I'm grateful for her. It's a, I, I think it says a lot that she is not sharing the SEC. It says a lot about the people who have the means to stack that deck. Um, I don't know, because there is absolutely no reason. There is absolutely no reason that you would look at this and think that she is less competent to chair the whole thing. Um, you know, regardless of your opinion on crypto, just in general, the way that she approaches what the agency's role in, in investor protection is. But Yeah, leadership anyway. and accountability. Excellent model. Um, Alex, is this true? You don't like the phrase, you're fired? Is it? Is it? Do you see what Angel says? She says, you're um, for Gary. I imagine it must be like, you know, like an apprentice thing. You're fired. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any problem with the phrase, but uh, but uh, I, I mean, if if I had to, then sure, I guess just in its affiliation with the orange man. Well, and not to get away from this or into that topic, except I just got to say, I wish if he had used that phrase more often in his presidency, um, I might have laughed more. <laughs> you know. If he had publicly gone on television and just said, you're fired. Yep. I was, um, because he certainly did a lot of it. You, you know, we were talking, we were talking last time about um, the Masari theses, and I haven't had a chance to read that whole document yet. Um, but you didn't read all 120 people, pages? No, I, it, 200 pages. Sorry. Uh, oh, I haven't. You, you Sorry. <laughs> but I did see the question, what are our favorite categories? And I wanted to just highlight that document again. I have added Masari to my list of organizations to ask for like sponsorship of different kinds because they just do, they're, they're, they're a great business in crypto in terms of the kind of research they do. Um, and I just wanted to plug that again. I will answer your question about our favorite categories, but, or at least mine, and then Alex will do his. But I got to tell you, the Masari Crypto Theses is the most comprehensive free document published every year that you can get. I'll, I'll put the link in the Discord. Um, you can just Google it. You got to give them an email sign up, but I'll, I'll put the PDF in there for all of you. They break down crypto into different sectors. And just to hear you say it um, is like, wow. Um, they talk about centralized finance. They talk about decentralized finance, layer one, peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, crypto as money consumer crypto. They have chapters on um, investing in crypto. They have, I mean, they really break this down. Policy in crypto, tech in crypto. For me personally, my favorite category, like broad umbrella category is consumer crypto. I get most excited about the ways everyday people will use this technology. Some of them monetary, most of them are not, to enhance the ways they make meaning with other people. Can you handle that? Yep, got it. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, I don't know how to, I blocked it. I don't know how to delete it, but that's my, that's absolutely my favorite is, there we is go. consumer crypto. Um, meaning, you know, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, Yep. Consumer crypto, but anything, anything that everyday people can use. Um, I'm not as excited about, you know, like layer one infrastructure, though I do think it's pretty cool. Or even honestly about like DeFi, though it is pretty cool. Um, consumer stuff is, 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 the, is the most fun to me. Um, and that's where I tend to invest. I tend to invest most in layer ones, in infrastructure. But I'm most excited about the stuff that's downstream. A long way to say... Don't come onto our show with hate speech. <laughs> what about you, Alex? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would honestly probably agree um, that the consumer side is my favorite because that's really like if you if you strip back the ultimate goal and ethos of what is the Web three movement, um, as much as Web three may just be a marketing term, it really is ultimately that our lives are becoming ever digitized and you don't really own any of it uh, and you should. So consumer better and better consumer applications of this technology to make your lives 
more yours. I think that's that's my most exciting part. Um, I was going to say, though, I have a pretty brief summary of the entire thesis written by Bard, if we want to uh, get a quick snapshot of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, it did it did a pretty good job. So uh, this is the the macro, the, the trends and the regulatory landscape and some other highlights uh, from Masari's 2024 crypto theses authored by Ryan Selfis. Um, <clears throat> that dude's got to just spend his entire year writing this thing. Like you imagine just like whipping this whipping this shit up, you know, like in the last month of the year. That's like super impressive. No, but I did make a video on it. And the fact that he he's been in the industry since 2013 and he's made this his job to head Masari. And so he not only has the time, he has millions of dollars and probably a bunch of employees who do a lot of, you know, digging for him. Not to mention if he's on Twitter, think of the people he's friends with because he's just been here that long, you know? So a lot of it is just give me the information and leave me alone in my office. Uh, give me some whiskey and coffee and I'll be back in 48 hours. You know what I mean? Or maybe 72. Intern, make me a graph, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, key points. The macro view, um, crypto's inevitability. <laughs> Despite recent turmoil, Selkis believes in crypto's underlying value of decentralization and open finance remains unstoppable. Uh, political influence. It will become increasingly political with regulators holding immense power to shape its future. Government will compete to capture its potential while tensions between control and innovations loom. I think that's... That's pretty spot on. Um, Bitcoin's dominance, it retains its Godzilla of finance status. Fucking great line. I like that, yeah. Uh, driving market sentiment and offering a store of value in a potentially unstable economic landscape. Technological trends, uh, account abstraction. Traditional Ethereum addresses will be replaced by smart contract wallets or smart accounts, enabling enhanced features like dynamic fees, bundled transactions, and multi-chain mm -hmm. operation. Um, which I do. I always think about one of the first conversations I had with someone when I was learning about the Web3 space was this friend of mine, Sam, who's a developer. And that is exactly what he said. He's like, dude, all of this, all, this was like three years ago now. All of these people who are arguing about which chain is better than, than this one for that reason or whatever, it's all pointless and stupid. They all need to exist. You need to have more. We don't have enough. And eventually when this thing does reach escape velocity and mass adoption, you're not even going to know which chain you're working on or using because it doesn't matter. Um, the future is multi-chain. Yeah. Uh, and just, just to add a little quick caveat, people yeah. have been talking about Solana, Angel mentioned Cosmos, you know, we, we love our, our favorite projects, whatever they are, but, but, you know, don't lose the forest for the trees, man. This is, this is one day, you know, we're driving all over the neighborhood with this thing. Um, let's see, layer two scaling, layer two solutions will gain traction, easing Ethereum congestion and providing a more affordable user experience. Optim optimism and Arbitrum are likely to lead the pack. Um, again, if you're just tuning in, this is yeah. the, this is the uh, summary of the 2024 crypto theses written by Ryan Selkis, who's the CEO of Masari, um, which is a huge crypto research uh, firm and um, organization. Um, so these are his opinions uh, and his his thoughts from the theses. Um, I'm just summarizing. Um, decentralized future or decentralized finance DeFi will evolve beyond basic lending and borrowing, embracing derivatives, tokenized assets and complex financial primitives. Uh, the regulatory landscape, relentless hostility, traditional financial institutions and regulators will remain wary of crypto, but their approach may shift from outright bans to increased oversight and licensing requirements. Um, you know, the begrudging adoption, as Hester said. Uh, CBDC, central bank digital currencies, will proliferate, posing both competition and potential integration opportunities for decentralized alternatives uh, and geopolitical competition. Governments will race to develop and utilize crypto technologies with implications for national security and global power dynamics. And this is, again, supported by what Hester was saying, that we in the United States have been for the last 10 years uh, doing everything that we can to squash that innovation and someone else is going to beat us there. And that will be exclusively uh, due to the fault of the SEC uh, for just squishing innovation at every chance they get. Uh, final highlights, 
NFTs, non-fungible tokens, will find new use cases beyond collectible, Jesus, collectibles, driving real-world asset tokenization and fostering community ownership models. Uh, again, PFPs were a good vehicle to demonstrate the use case of the technology, uh, but really the story here, in my opinion, uh, and in Ryan's opinion, is that they are the gateway, the gateway drug to the use of token technology. And really, the interesting point here is that you are able to own unique digital property, which you've never been able to do before. And that's way more fucking powerful than anyone is giving it credit for being. Yeah. Um, finally, this is these were these last two are interesting. Uh, soul bound tokens, tokens bound to an individual's identity will emerge, enabling reputation systems and access control mechanisms. That's some black mirror shit. Um, but uh, it is definitely worth talking and thinking about this is kind of uh, some more cases for the use of, of smart contracts, tokens and blockchain in things like your medical record uh, or important financial documentation, identity documentation, birth certificates, marriage license, all that sort of stuff. All the databases that run your life. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, quick, quick aside, very recently I traveled to Chicago to the German embassy to fill out paperwork and finalize applications to receive my German passport because um, I am a German citizen, fun fact. And I had to bring a lot of paperwork to do that. And all of that important documentation was just in a folder in my backpack and like a puddle could have undone all of that, which doesn't seem great. I'm carrying my social security card, my birth certificate, my marriage license, my DD-214, and a couple other pieces of very like if someone else got their hands on just that folder it has no security yeah. or you left your backpack behind yeah uh so like it when we really like strip it back and think about it like that's still how we're using and maintaining all of those documents and like it's considered you know protected enough to like have it in a box in your closet um yikes mm. uh, and then finally uh web3 gaming was highlighted uh, play to earn gaming models will mature, attracting wider audiences and blurring the lines between gaming and finance. Uh, super interesting because one of my opinions, one of the hills that I will absolutely die on is that when it comes to use case and utility demonstration of Web3 technology, gaming is probably the easiest vehicle to use to show people the, uh, the, uh, I never know what you're laughing at. I'm so sorry. My, you, you said gaming is probably one of the, you, you had so much attitude. Oh. Your head moved about half a millimeter, but it was, did anyone else see that? Alex was like, gaming is probably one of the best use kids. I was like, okay. I was, I was like waiting for that. First of all, <laughs> Don't disagree. There's no, problem, there's no problem about it. It is the best use case. That's how you know. That's how you know this man is serious. Alex <laughs> is, is going to die on this hill and then he's going to bring I some will. attitude about it. I will absolutely die on this hill with my attitude. I'm sorry, I'm sorry brother. It was just great. <laughs> I was looking at the comments. I was like, no, it could have been that I must have done or said something. <laughs> um, but anyway, I just, it was really, it was, it's cool to see that highlighted. I'm going to have to go into the actual thesis and find that part and read the actual, like his full write up on it. Yeah. Um, Cause that's exciting. And I completely agree i mean if if i was to make a prediction of any kind it's just that that is a that is a niche and a space and a genre of of the tech that i am like most excited about more than anything because at the end of the day like i always say video gaming globally is a 300 plus billion dollar industry probably more uh and we gamers are the number one consumer and customer of that industry and we don't own any of the shit that we pay for like Gun to my head, I couldn't tell you how much money I've spent on video games over the last 20 years of my life. Um, but I can count on one hand the number of things I actually own in relation and regard to all of that money that I have spent. Um, you know, it's it's ridiculous, it's insane. And gamers just need to realize that at some point they will wake up and realize that that is the case and you will change the way you think about it. Um. So let me let me add one little thing about the as long as we're touching on the thesis, this is my favorite part about it is they chapter by chapter will usually do like here's a project they're watching. They'll give you an overview on it. They're talking about these are consumer products they're excited about USDT on Tron base from Coinbase, which we've talked about before Celestia. 
They're talking about Fire Dancer. They have Farcaster. They have Blur. And a lot of these projects are going to be things that uh, you may or may not have heard of if you're in the industry. So first of all, you're probably going to hear something new. They're going to give you, you know, the founder or team members in a blue link so that you can click it, immediately go to their Twitter and follow them or add them to a circle. And then they're putting you in touch with projects that may have a token, may have a product, but many of them don't. Or a lot of the topic areas in this thesis are, are like, uh, you know, ZK rollups, something that really is not to fruition at scale, kind of like Web3 Gaming. But then they're going to tell you like the 10 companies that Ryan Selkis and Masari thinks are the furthest along. And that's the thing to emphasize. Alex is like, how does he write this thing every year? Can you imagine? Uh, but this guy's job is literally to spend millions of dollars employing other researchers to help him free his time so he can tell you how it is and how it's going to be in blockchain. I mean, we work here. We live here. And I'm telling you, this, this, this is a good source of news. Your influencer should be getting their news from this, among other things. Uh, you, you may not, I don't like his politics. Uh, I think he's a little like, you know, but whatever. Like, this is, this is somebody worth listening to, you know, big time. And it's, For whatever sure. you research after this, you know, like, it'll give you a good head start. Yeah. Uh, you know. I was going to say too, um, I just, uh, I've been, I'm, I'm super impressed with how Bard is, um, is. Yeah. Did you give it a, a, like a link or just ask it about the thesis? My prompt was literally summarize the 2024 crypto thesis by Masari, please. Always say, please. You never know. You never know. Oh, always, always, man. Say, please. Yeah, and thank, thank you. Too. Please and thank you. Thank to you so the I, dude, I apologize to it. I'm like, I'm sorry. I meant whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I just I love to think that at some point, like some analyst or, or the AI itself is like, you know, looking through it and just like, look at this idiot, just please and thank you and apologizing. And and you know what else I do it too is because I um I know the day is coming when we're going to have our local personal AIs. I've played with some of the tools that do it, and I think that'll be the easiest way to make it sound like me. In conversation with everyday people, I I say please and thank you. So if I'm going to train an AI to act as me, I don't want it to be like that's wrong, you know, or okay. whatever, like you're not doing it right. <laughs> but also when you do get your personal one, what if your personal one wants to like get some dirt on you and it just asks open AI, like, Hey, what's this dude's deal? And open AI is like, dude, that, that guy's rude as hell to me. Right. Uh, and then your AI is like, Hey, fuck you. I'm not interested in, in, uh, <laughs> yeah, he can go pluck a duck. Anyway, the, uh, the, the thing that I just wanted to highlight is that, so I, I prompted it with that and it gave me the exact write up that I just shared. Um, and I dropped, I dropped the full text of its summary in the general chat there, but then obviously it's like, you know, is there anything you'd like to know more about within the report? And I was like, yeah, sure. Tell me more about the web three gaming, uh, section. And it just gave another great write up organized, annotated, you know, like formatted, uh, to do this with a whole bunch of links, um, that it then sent me to specific pieces within the report itself. Uh, and then another couple, um, uh, links to some other sources to learn more about Web3 Gaming. Awesome. So I mean, if you don't have the time, I don't know why you wouldn't have the time to read a 200 page dry right. document. Do you got kids, a job, yeah. a life? <laughs> if for some reason you find yourself not able to sit down and stomach reading 200 plus pages of really dry crypto information, uh, you can use BARD. Uh, and use it to find stuff and then, you know, just use that as the impetus to like go in and find the specific section within the report that you actually do want to learn about uh, and then skip the other 100 and 190 pages. Um, that is probably what I will do because it's going to take me a while to get through this whole thing. Uh, but I'll summarize it all into sections for myself here and then uh, go in and read specific passages. And, and meanwhile, uh, behind the scenes, I just want you all to know that Alex is not only updating the Discord with these articles while he's having this conversation with us, he's in the chat and he is answering people's general questions too. I just saw your, your link about uh, the faceless and I was like, oh my God. So kudos to you, my friend. Nothing, uh, it's just it's a personal like it's been like this ever since we launched I, I hate the vibe and the the optic of unanswered questions about yeah, anything cool. related if like if you're a project founder and you have holders and they ask you a question I hate keeping people waiting um, which is probably an unhealthy obsession with uh, remaining in the discord but 
If you ask a question, I will answer it very quickly. Um, I see we have our friend Daniel in the chat. Hello, Daniel. Good to see you, my friend. Buy crypto, he says. Um, if you uh, if you got a take on the ETF and you want to share it, um, we just went through Gary's opinion. We went through Hester's opinion. We've gone up and down the hole all over the place. Um, but of course, your voice is welcome if you got something you want to share with people. And uh, if you are watching the show and you want to share something, you got a question, we're, we're about at that time when we start to wrap up the show. So get it in. You know, don't don't be sad about it. But remember, we're back. Tuesday, Thursday, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, 1 p.m. UTC. And you can always chat us anytime at the Discord. It's free, discord.gg slash the many. And of course, you know, if you're here on TikTok with us, give us a follow and ask your comment, uh, leave your comment, ask your question on any of our videos. You know, we, we want to do what we can to help. And um, we're working on, on making the show, making the show more valuable. Um, so if you've got suggestions, good jokes, words of wisdom, feedback, don't hesitate. And next week, uh, when I go down to Atlanta to put my butt on television, um, I'm going to make a pit stop in Savannah. We won't be uh, live on Tuesday or Thursday together, but I don't know. Maybe we do like a little uh, quick bonus weekend edition rise up morning show from Savannah together. Wouldn't that be cool? Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to ask you. I don't know exactly what your what your timing is, but uh, if you're if you're here, I'm going to drag you to the rescue on Friday. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. I'm thinking about coming, um, I'll arrive Thursday night is, is what my plan is. Um, I, I do want to stop by Hit Network Thursday morning. That's my plan. Um, you know, I, I may or may not do the show there. I might do it after the show, depending on what time they open kind of thing. And then I'm yep. basically going to, you know, shake some hands and get out of Dodge and come on over to you. And oh, I love that. That would be so great. Sounds good. We will, we will have your room ready. Thank you. Thank you. Man. I texted Alex. I said, you know, I... I, I like to travel light, by which I mean I'm not much of an imposing house guest, but I recognize that last minute, like, hey, can I come hang out with you? Some people might be like, sure, yeah, of course. And then behind the scenes, they're like, you know, you got to clean everything and get it all ready or whatever. Uh, happy to be here, easy to host. And so I said to Alex, hey, man, you know, I've got my, my big tents. I so don't want to be an inconvenience to you and Christina. I'm glad to just pop a tent up in your yard. And he's like, Evan, we have a house with a guest room. Yeah. But... Like, let it be known that if you want to host me uh, and give me an opportunity to sleep out in nature somewhere, um, say less. Like, just generally speaking, if there's an opportunity to sleep on the ground by myself and it might be cold, send it. I'm there. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not sleeping in my yard. Um, I don't know why it's filtering some of these comments. I'm yeah, so sorry. sorry about that. I think it's because we had a we had a, a spammer come in here and I added one word from their username to the uh, like filter this list, but that yeah. you know that word is never said. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. know. Interesting. The uh, so bright bright side. No, I'm not. I'm not Orthodox. We don't we don't do any of that. Uh, yeah, the German ancestry though. I could see. I could see that. Orthodox yeah, my so. I, w like with my family when I was growing up, we did do it a little bit differently. Um, we didn't really ever do too much on Christmas Day itself. You know, that was more like relaxing. Everything happened on the 24th uh, to the point where like you'd go out and get the tree on the morning of the 24th and set it up on the 24th. You'd keep it up until January 6th and take it down on Three Kings Day. Because um, Orthodox Christmas is January 7th. Um, and then, uh, you know, we do like the big Christmas dinner. That's on the 24th. Presents are on the evening of the 24th. Um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, never did it. Never did anything or Christmas morning. That was a time when my parents would sleep and me and my sister would entertain ourselves with a giant plate of cookies and all the stuff we got the night before. Yeah. And, and Merry Christmas to anybody who is celebrating an Orthodox Christmas. I um, had a roommate in Bowling Green um, who, who was uh, in Orthodox. Um, th that was his liturgical tradition. And I uh, celebrated Easter and Christmas with them. They call it Easter Pascha. And it is, uh, depending on who you ask, one of the oldest living traditions of like Christian liturgical worship. And so it's very fascinating from a historical perspective. We walked around the church building at three in the morning, uh, chanting with, with a cross and then interacted with like a door as if it was the tomb. And on the other side of this door where like Jesus is resurrected was a huge feast. Uh, I had never gotten drunk at a church before with like the the clergyman, but uh, we did that night. That's that's how they do it. I was like, wow, this is this is uh, robust, <laughs> festive. 
Oh, goodness, it's happening again. Cute pets in my profile. Oh, I'm glad that one got blocked. The Easter in January 7 Christmas change is based on the original Julian calendar. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting history with it. Um, for people who are in, like, you know, interested in theology nerds. Um, well, Alex, let's, uh, let's uh, get some final thoughts, good jokes, words, words of wisdom uh, from us. If, you, if you've got a thing on the way out the door, if you're, you're celebrating an Orthodox Christmas uh, over the week, then Merry Christmas to you. Happy New Year to everybody else. Let us know what you're looking forward to. Let us know what you're thinking about. We're going to be gone for a couple of days. So one last time, I'll say, if you want to hang out, get in the Discord. It is, I'll try and pop it in the chat one more time, discord.gg slash the many. You can find us there. Always going to be free. Um, and uh, and we're going to make it as valuable to you as we can. You know, everybody needs a home on the internet. It's one thing to spend 24 hours a day learning this stuff yourself. It's hard to know who to ask, what to ask. But in a room full of people like the faceless many, you are going to accelerate your learning journey because you'll share what you know. People will share what they know. Resources all over the place. You're going to learn and grow together way faster. And safer, I think, you know? You got friends like Alex watching out for you? It's good stuff. Alex, what did you do for your birthday? Did you um, have like a big hoot and nanny celebrate? Did you get to just like game and chill for a bit? Yep, nice. the, weather held, the weather held out and uh, did not lose power. It was a birthday miracle. Um, so played, played a lot of Xbox and um, a cake. That's about it. Oh, yeah, man. That's wonderful. That's a great way to start the year. Um, I am about to go walk Ricky the dog. And then I'm going to check in with my esthetician who's going to take a look at my rump, which is a little bit red. I'm not worried about it, but I am manifesting smooth skin. Something you would know about, right? Hey, sweet girl. She's was napping. <laughs> Yeah, she has that like super sleepy look, like <laughs> waking me up. Well, you know, obviously she doesn't have eyes; they don't work. So yeah, I know. She always cut her. She cut her. Cut her face a couple times in her sleep last night, which is super fun. What always. do you? Uh, what do you? What do you use to uh, treat treat when she gets cuts? Like a stiffic pencil, or is there a topical or something like that? Because I've got to imagine it's like some high powered stuff. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, her skin is super sensitive, prone to rips, tears from just touches. Um, oh, it's, it's this hydrogel. like antimicrobial hydrogel stuff. So they just put it on and it, you know. Well, because I'm doing, I asked because I'm doing a topical two times daily lotion uh, to, to minimize redness and irritation, mm -hmm. which is apparently a common side effect of waxing, especially if you are a newcomer to the discipline. And uh, like you I know, said, I, I'm not worried about it. But I am going to check with the esthetician because we're on camera Wednesday, people. So if you're a thinker or a prayer or, you know, routinely like to make sacrifices to ensure good outcomes, then, you know, do it for my butt. Alex, what's yeah, your name? No. I, for I keep forgetting. I always forget. Phoebe. Phoebe. Yeah, so she, I mean, you know, they're they're pretty shallow, all of these. But it's just, you know, like if her claw touches her skin, pretty much just rips open. Um, so, I mean, I do a lot of Neosporin too, like wherever you can get it, you know, cause she has like cuts on ankles and paws and toes and all that kind of stuff. So like those can be wrapped, but like, it's pretty hard to wrap her face. So, um, she's just a little scar face. She got scars everywhere, but face. well, Phoebe, it's good to see you girl. I'll see you soon. I'll be there. Um, that's uh that's I, I'm well met, man. I really appreciate everybody for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the kind words. Thanks for trusting us to to just be here with you. It's it's honestly it's a great honor. And I, I, I'm I'm sure you would say the same thing that that people would trust us enough to ask us their questions, and uh, and and spend some time with us on a Thursday morning. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who, who hung out and watched. It's good to, it's good to be back after the holidays and the full swing of things. And, uh, today, today was a good one. I was very excited for today cause I have a lot of, a lot of opinions about all this mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm, 
now we now we wait and we see what else uh, what else comes of this. I I think that this is a I think that this is a catalyst for a lot of other stuff in the industry to take some validity and take some take some shape. Angel, thank you so much. You did not have to do that. Yeah, very kind of you. And when it happens, whatever happens, don't worry. We're going to tell you about it. Whoa. Rip. Can you believe that? I was doing the outro to the show and somebody called me rude. Kevin <sighs> rugged himself right away. When it happens, whatever happens, we will tell you about it. And we'll be back here Tuesday on the Rise Up Morning Show. Until then, my friends, we'll see you in the Discord. Have a great weekend. Rise up.